before to welcome uh, Kostis Papagakis, and he will tell us about reinforcement learning as applied to Pompom Bootstrap. Please okay. start. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful workshop. Uh, second, thank you for sticking it out to the bitter end. I know it's quite tempting to kind of, you know, go home on a Friday afternoon. So what I will be talking about today is a set of uh, uh, novel uh, numerical approaches for the conformal bootstrap. And these approaches are, is, uh, are, have been developed uh, in collaboration with my uh, wonderful colleague, Vasilis Nyarkos, who is at the University of Crete. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years now, and uh, we have a certain uh, number of papers that you see uh, over there below. The talk uh, today will be based on the most recent one, which appeared last June. And these works have involved a string of uh, postdocs and uh, students at Queen Mary. Uh, the one that I will be talking about today is uh, with Vasilis Paul Richmond, who is a postdoc at Queen Mary, and Alex Stapleton and Mitchell Woolley, who are uh, my PhD students. So another thing I would like to say is that uh, if you uh, work in uh, RL-related uh, physics applications or ML-related physics applications, uh, we will have a postdoc available at Queen Mary, uh, along with David Berman and David Vegg. The ad is going to go live at some point next week, so please uh, go and check it out and uh, um, tell your friends. So what is the motivation behind this work? CFTs are uh, theories of great interest in our community. I don't have to motivate them really for you, but just to go through the motions, they appear in the UV and IR limits of quantum field theory in the study of phase transitions and in the study of quantum gravity via the ADA-CFT correspondence. And even though they're very special theories and they enjoy a high degree of symmetry, their non-perturbative solution is actually hard. This is where modern approaches such as the conformal bootstrap, the latest incarnation of the conformal bootstrap, uh, come in. Uh, the conformal bootstrap basically uh, is, a, is a program where one makes certain assumptions about the spectrum of the conformal field theory, and then you can check for the consistency of these assumptions with the so-called crossing equations, which I will remind you of in a couple of slides. And this program is greatly assisted by the fact that um, you can use powerful linear, linear and semi-definite programming methods, which allow you to carve out uh, sort of regions in the parameter space of your CFT. And in certain cases, if you are smart about which crossing equations you use, you can even uh, isolate uh, CFT data to great accuracy. So what I will be talking about today is a different approach to the numerical bootstrap, which makes use of non-convex optimization techniques. And uh, we started this uh, uh, excursion, let's say, into, uh, into, this, uh, into this topic by uh, using reinforcement learning as a non-convex uh, optimizer. But we're not limited to the use of reinforcement learning, although I will highlight that uh, aspect today because of uh, the themes of this workshop. So machine learning is everywhere. That's why you're here as well. Probably it's uh, a tool that is becoming increasingly accessible to people who are not computer scientists. Uh, and uh, uh, as you probably have heard many times over the last week or a uh, few months as part of the program, there is three main flavors, broadly speaking, of machine learning. There is supervised learning where one has a large data set and then you can use some of them uh, to train your uh, neural network and then uh, predict uh, new data, uh, hopefully with a good uh, accuracy. There's also unsupervised learning where, again, you have a large data set and then you ask the algorithm, for example, to find out some structure uh, within, uh, within that data set. And then there is also reinforcement learning, which kind of stands apart from these other two flavors of ML. Uh, because uh, there you do not need uh, a large data set uh, for your algorithm uh, to work. In fact, the algorithm generates its own data set by interacting with a so-called environment, a set of rules. And then the agent, uh, the algorithm receives feedback based on that performance. And this is the uh, flavor of machine learning that I will be using uh, for my purposes today. So... There is many applications of machine learning and computer science approaches already to uh, high energy physics and in mathematics. As I said, uh, I would like to use reinforcement learning uh, today as a stochastic optimization algorithm. And I should be very clear from the beginning that this kind of approach engages in metaheuristics. So I'm going to be using approximate strategies here that guide this optimization search to near optimal solutions. Uh, this approach is not rigorous. Uh, there is uh, quite uh, uh, sort of some uncertainty in determining the errors, but it's less expensive than the rigorous approaches to the bootstrap, and it's also very widely applicable. So hopefully you will see what the kind of benefits of this approach are and how well it can perform. So from the physics point of view, the goal is not to replace, but to complement the uh, standard uh, numerical 
bootstrap methods with new tools. And conversely, maybe one can also learn uh, via these applications uh, something about reinforcement learning and uh, machine learning uh, more generally. So this is the outline for the rest of the talk. I will begin with a summary. I know that people come from different backgrounds in this, in this meeting and the topic is not conformal theories. So I will uh, keep the details quite suppressed. Uh, uh, I will give you, however, a, a flavor of the theoretical framework uh, that is involved. Then I will spend quite some time in describing the numerical algorithm that was developed to tackle this problem. And I will focus uh, to some extent explaining how reinforcement learning fits into that uh, paradigm as an optimization algorithm. And for the last third or so of the talk, I will focus on a particular application, uh, the latest application that we uh, attacked, which is this one-dimensional uh, defect uh, CFT, uh, which you obtain by uh, looking at a uh, infinite uh, Wilson line uh, defect uh, in N equals four super young mills. So to just make some very broad maybe connection to the themes of this workshop, uh, as far as machine learning is concerned, reinforcement learning is my gateway there. As far as gravity is concerned, uh, maybe through the ADSFT correspondence, you can learn some information about gravity. If you put these CFTs, uh, let's say at finite temperature about you know, black holes as well. And uh, regarding integrability, uh, this 1D defect CFT inherits uh, integrability properties from N equals 4 super young mills. And I will actually make use of results from the quantum spectral curve uh, to supplement uh, the standard numerical bits. Okay, so at least even tangentially, I have touched on upon all these themes uh, that this workshop is supposed to, to cover. <laughs> Number, I will not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will not have anything to say about that. Uh, I, and I also I know that people come from uh, diverse backgrounds, so um, I don't expect you to have prior knowledge of of this kind of uh, moving parts that will appear today. So I highly encourage you to stop me and ask me questions, which might even be sort of you know for other people in the audience, sort of simple, so that everyone is on board. Very good. So uh, the requisite sort of introductory slide about uh, conformal field theories, uh, they're very special theories. They enjoy uh, the uh, fact that uh, you can work with the operator product expansion, which I uh, present here just for scalar operators for simplicity. If you have two operators in your CFT that come very close together, you can express their product in terms of this uh, infinite series organized uh, as uh, uh, using your, the conformal primaries of your theory. And uh, these coefficients here are known as the OP coefficients. So the collection of OP coefficients and uh, the uh, spectrum of your CFT, so the scaling dimensions and the spins of your conformal primaries are known as the CFT data. And via the operator product expansion, you can use them to in principle compute any correlator in your theory. So any higher point function, you can use the OP to reduce to lower point functions, uh, eventually down to three point functions. And three point functions are fixed uh, entirely up to a constant by conformal symmetry. This constant is related very closely to this OP coefficient. So if I reduce everything to three or two point functions, then I can, uh, I can compute. Now this can be put uh, into uh, great use uh, in the computation of this four point correlation function. So let's assume that I have four operators inserted at points one, two, three, and four. And then using the OPE, there is various ways in which I can perform this computation. One is to do the OPE between operator one and two and three and four. This is the S channel way of performing this computation uh, to write it in terms of a sum of two point functions. Or I can do, for example, the OPE between two, three, and one and four, and I get another in principle equivalent result. By equating these two uh, results, uh, what uh, uh, one gets is uh, the so-called crossing equation. So I've kind of written them in a condensed form in this, uh, uh, in this line over here. So this is the contribution from the S channel. There is a, a set of OP coefficients squared. I will they sort of loosely refer to them as OP coefficients squared. They're literally OP coefficients squared when the four-point function you're considering is that of identical operators. Uh, there's also uh, these functions G that you see over there, which are conformal blocks. Conformal blocks are known functions uh, at least definitely in even dimensions in close analytic form, which depend on the uh, scaling dimensions of the operators that are exchanged uh, in your operator product expansion. And uh, this is the T-channel contribution. And uh, uh, so our, my unknowns here are delta, the scaling dimensions of these operators, the spins, and the OP coefficient squared. And these equations also have a functional dependence on Z and Z bar. Z and Z bar uh, parameterize a uh, complex plane, the so-called cross-ratio plane, which are uh, two invariant, uh, conformally invariant combinations of these insertion points, x1, 2, 3, and 4. So these are constraining equations that uh, the CFT has to satisfy, and uh, they have to be obeyed for all Z and Z bar, and in principle, uh, uh, impose very strong constraints on your CFT. 
but they are very hard to solve exactly. And the reason for that is that they're doubly infinite. So there's an infinite number of unknowns because these sums are unconstrained. And at the same time, there's an infinite number of equations because uh, these are uh, depend continuously on Z and Z bar. So if you want to uh, arrive at a, a numerically tractable system, you have to perform some kind of simplification. Now, the most naive thing that you might think of is to perform a truncation of the spectrum. So just take this equation here and just cut it off at some point. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, we uh, go one step further and choose an appropriate spin partition. I will describe to you how we can inform the spin partition and what it means in the next uh, slide. By performing this truncation, and hopefully you perform it in an intelligent way, such that you don't lose you know, the information that the full crossing equation encodes, uh, you've at least reduced the number of unknowns to a finite set. And then you'd like to also reduce the number of uh, equations uh, that you have. And this you can do in various ways. A particularly simple one is to just make sure that you choose a, a sort of representative sample of points on this cross ratio plane. Now, this has to be done with some care because the OP does not converge sort of uniformly uh, on the cross ratio plane. Uh, uh, but, uh, okay, this is standard. Uh, there's some standard uh, approaches uh, in the context of the conformal bootstrap about how to pick, for example, uh, these points or how to work with derivatives around uh, crossing symmetric points and so on. So uh, this leads to uh, a system which has a finite number of unknowns determined by your truncation and uh, a finite number of constraining equations and Z for the number of equations and unknown for the number of unknowns. And then the data that uh, uh, I would like to determine after I fix the spin partition are just the scaling dimensions of the operators that are involved and the OP coefficient squared. So if I find uh, this information out, uh, I, uh, or if I solve for these, uh, for these unknowns, I, I determine quite a lot about my CFD. Uh, so after performing this truncation and reduction, uh, what uh, one has uh, then is a, uh, uh, this truncated reduced set of crossing equations, which in principle are not satisfied exactly. So if you went and plugged in the, let's say you knew the analytic solution of this theorem, you plugged in these, uh, uh, these, these values because of the fact that you've sort of cut off uh, a large number of uh, operators with higher scaling dimension, uh, you will not have uh, this uh, equation uh, be satisfied exactly. Uh, but uh, this is a problem that I would like to try and solve. So the idea is that if you perform your truncation in a good way, uh, somehow just by minimizing this equation, you might be able to isolate the uh, CFT data that in the full theory are close enough to the, uh, to the, analytic, uh, to the exact analytic solutions. And this approach is different from the one that people uh, take in the standard uh, or mainstream numerical bootstrap. And I'll have a couple of slides trying to highlight some of these differences uh, in a minute. A couple of words about the spin partition. So um, how do we choose, what do I mean by spin partition? I mean that uh, uh, I have operators in the S channel and the T channel, and then I can I give my algorithm a priori some information about how many of them there exists, or spin zero, spin one, and so on. How do I make this determination? Well, in the problems, yes, Eugene. Yeah, no. Yes, so, so the reason why this truncation is supposed to work is that the OP has to converge, or at least there are some points in the cross ratio plane where it converges exponentially fast in the scaling dimension. So uh, the idea is that, you know, if you truncate it at high enough, you know, scaling dimensions, there is exponentially suppressed corrections. Uh, so what do I mean by this uh, by, by this uh, spin uh, spin partition? Uh, at certain values of the spin, I have uh, uh, op certain operators a naught operators or b naught operators spin zero a one b one etc. How do I determine the spin partition? So for the problems that I have in mind, um, there uh, the theories the CFTs that, that I consider have some exactly marginal deformation. So there is a conformal manifold, and uh, there are corners in the conformal manifold where I can solve my theory analytically. So I know, for example, the scaling dimensions of the operators at that point, and maybe the OP coefficients as well. And uh, I definitely know their spins. So the scaling dimensions, of course, can change. The operators can acquire anomalous dimensions, but the spins remain the same. And uh, uh, the whole sort of um, idea of uh, what we're doing is that starting from that particular point in the conformal manifold where I know the solution, I apply my algorithm by changing that exactly marginal deformation slowly, and hopefully the CFT data also change slowly, and you can track 
their evolution uh, as you vary that parameter to sort of finite distances uh, from, uh, from that original uh, point. So this idea of uh, determining the spin partition is giving you additional new input compared to the mainstream numerical uh, bootstrap. And uh, the hope is that by making a proper choice of this spin partition, you end up having a good approximation of the, uh, of the full four-point function. As I mentioned earlier on, um, now that we've truncated the crossing equations, uh, you're not guaranteed that there will be an exact solution to your, uh, to your, uh, these approximate crossing equations. And even if there was an exact crossing solution, uh, solution that it would not be the one that, uh, uh, the one that, uh, you would have if you were to keep all the terms in your OPE expansion. But uh, the hope is that uh, somehow, um, you know, there is some kind of structure of minimizing this uh, uh, optimization problem where you can, it's, if it's not like the global minimum, maybe it's kind of, there's some local minimum which you can track as you start incorporating more and more terms and kind of approximates the solution to a good enough accuracy. It turns out that because of the nature of uh, my crossing equations, so let me go back a couple of slides. So these conformal blocks usually are uh, combinations of hypergeometric functions in which the operator dimension appears in a nonlinear way. Uh, so in fact, this uh, optimization problem of trying to find uh, the deltas and Cs that minimize uh, this set of crossing equations is a non-convex optimization problem. And originally, uh, we thought that maybe if we incorporate large enough truncations, we will get a better approximation to this four-point function. Uh, but of course, then you run into the problem of dimensionality, the curse of dimensionality. The you know, larger the unknowns that you have, then the more difficult it is for your optimization algorithm to find a solution, and then it loses accuracy in that way. So uh, um, there are some difficulties with, uh, with, uh, with this approach. Nevertheless, uh, we attempted this uh, naive idea in a, a range of models, originally in simple two-dimensional models, which you know how to solve analytically, such as 2D easing uh, or the compact boson CFT. And uh, uh, then the algorithm was, in fact, able to locate uh, the solution with very hard truncations of only order 10 operators. We also uh, attacked uh, at the follow-up uh, at the 60 to zero theory with order 45 operators. And there we had some uh, agreement with the results that people obtained from the superconformal bootstrap uh, for the to zero theory and uh, from some uh, implementation of uh, conformal dispersion relations involving the OP inversion formula. And I would like to say that the uh, when you see here order 10 operators, for each operator there is a scaling dimension and an OP coefficient. So there's twice the number of unknowns. So this is order 20 unknowns. This uh, goes uh, order 90 unknowns, so there was kind of an order of magnitude roughly increase in the uh, dimensionality of your of our search space uh, between these two works. And for the two zero theory, we actually found some interesting features. The standard bootstrap, as I will mention in, in a minute, does not necessarily allow you to study a specific theory. So there is an AD classification of 60 to zero theories and uh, with our approach, which actually see uh, two different uh, curves. So there were two different types of solutions for this, uh, for this conformal data. But uh, in the latest, uh, so every time we try to uh, attack a different uh, uh, case, we actually improve our implementation. And in this uh, latest paper where we uh, work with this uh, 1D CFT, uh, we uh, have a certain numerical but also conceptual improvements. And one of them is uh, the approximation of the tail of, uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this sum. So instead of, if I were to go back, instead of just performing a hard cutoff of these sums over here, there's a way of approximating all the sum uh, the remaining part of the sum that you have uh, uh, you have thrown away, and this uh, significantly increased the precision uh, and accuracy of our results. Okay, so at this point, maybe I can make some comments about how what we're doing uh, compares uh, to the uh, uh, mainstream uh, numerical conformal bootstrap, so that you don't leave this room and you think that I'm doing the standard numerical conformal bootstrap. What people do in the mainstream numerical bootstrap, which by the way is a, a topic that has been developed for about 15 years, there's hundreds of papers in that field. Uh, you uh, kind of very broadly speaking made some mild assumptions about the uh, operator uh, spectrum of your theory uh, at low uh, scaling dimensions. Sometimes you also set sort of gaps, uh, differences between the dimensions uh, of, that, uh, of those low lying operators. And then instead of uh, directly trying to solve this equation, you uh, look for a linear functional or a collection of linear functionals, uh, which are constructed in this way. So you take derivatives in these uh, conformal cross ratio 
uh, variable z and z bar with some coefficient evaluated at a particular point on the cross-ratio plane where you know the VOP converges very, very fast. And you try to find linear functions that actually uh, lead to a wrong, uh, to a manifestly wrong statement. So if you do that, you can in fact uh, invalidate the assumptions that you made at the beginning. And this is how people make these exclusion plots where the CFD data that they're looking for have to lie uh, within some particular region of your parameter space. This uh, technology is uh, therefore um, kind of boils down to be able to find all the uh, uh, linear functionals, uh, or as many linear functions as you can uh, possibly can to invalidate the assumptions that you make. And this is where this uh, linear and semi-definite programming technology comes in. And this uh, is essentially a series of convex optimization algorithms uh, that you can use, and they are very fast and very efficient and so on. On the uh, other hand, our truncation methods uh, uh, do something different. They make strong, strong assumptions about the spectrum of operators, uh, as uh, uh, seen by determining the spin partition that I described a couple of slides ago. And uh, in this case, instead of trying to look for linear functionals, we are trying to directly attack these uh, truncated crossing equations. And this leads to a problem in convex optimization as opposed to uh, uh, non-convex optimization as opposed to convex optimization. Very good. Some other features of the mainstream bootstrap, also known as the linear functional method, is that they are rigorous. So the bounds that uh, you can get with the linear functional methods are hard bounds that you can trust. Uh, however, each search gives bounds on a limited set of CFD data, uh, albeit with very high accuracy. Uh, you can do also smart things where you take bounds uh, or you create bounds using multiple crossing equations, so multi-correlators, multiple correlators, and then uh, these big uh, regions of uh, allowed, uh, uh, allowed in your search space shrink to small islands, which uh, uh, allow you to determine your uh, CFD data at high accuracy, but then you have high dimensional uh, searches which uh, in the linear functional method are quite hard computationally and require much higher than machine precision. Another thing that they require is positivity of the OPE coefficients. So for the four-point bootstrap, unitarity implies that the OPE coefficients are positive, and this is essential for applying the linear functional method. But there are many cases, for example, if you'd like to study a CFT which is not unitary, or if you have a CFT with a boundary, uh, um, there are uh, bulk to boundary uh, interactions, uh, where, and if you try to find crossing equations associated with these, uh, with these correlators, they are not uh, positive. Or even, in fact, if you wanted to construct bootstrap for higher point functions, five and so on, positivity is not guaranteed. So that's where the standard numerical bootstrap cannot, uh, uh, cannot work. Finally, uh, the approach uh, of the mainstream bootstrap is to explore in the full space of theories. So um, you just make some assumptions about certain operators and then you get you know, the dimensions, for example, as you see in this plot, uh, this is in three dimensions, uh, what the energy operator could be as a function of the spin operator. Uh, and then sometimes you get nice features uh, where some theory which is special and you know lies uh, in, in, in the kink of these, uh, um, uh, of, these, uh, of these exclusion plots, okay? But they are not necessarily built, uh, these searches, to uh, be able to isolate to begin with a specific theory. Now, what about our truncation methods? So in this case, searches are quite cheap. Uh, uh, they do not give you rigorous bounds. They give you an approximately crossing symmetric four-point function. Uh, uh, and there is some issue with trying to determine a priori what your errors are. So there's a lot of, there could be systematic errors, there could be numerical errors, it's very hard to disentangle what's going on, and you have to be a little bit careful on how to interpret your data. But uh, they are, as I said, cheap and they're efficient with uh, multiple correlators and other available, some rules that you might uh, obtain and would like to impose in addition to your crossing equations. They do not require positivity of the OPE coefficients, so they could be uh, applicable in the case of uh, CFPs with a boundary or the higher point bootstrap and so on. And they also allow you to explore uh, towards specific theories. So our idea is to you give me a specific theory, I input as much information as I can about the theory, uh, and then I try to determine uh, something about uh, the, the data that, uh, that is involved. 
So I have yeah. a question. So as you say, these two approaches are somewhat complementary, different uh, aspects. Yeah. So is, is there a way to make a kind of synergy? Like Absolutely. Example? So this is, I will, I will highlight that oh, again. Okay. So see. what we've done so far uh, is we've been trying to see how our approach compares to the bootstrap by yes, trying yes. to look at the same data. But in fact, you could use the results that the standard bootstrap gives to even further constrain our oh, searches. Yes, yes, yes. And that hopefully will give you something even more. Yeah. So I'll make some comments about that towards the end. Thank you for the question. Good. So hopefully I've convinced you that the um, 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 trying to uh, use the conformal bootstrap to determine CFT data has reduced to the problem, uh, to a non-convex optimization problem. And now you've got this non-convex optimization problem, you can try and find your favorite non-convex optimizer to help you solve it. So there's many different non-convex optimizers that you can use. Uh, in fact, because we will be thinking of a relatively large enough uh, uh, dimensional search space, uh, the landscape of this uh, objective function that we're trying to minimize can be complicated with many local minima, many saddles. These can have comparable cost, comparable value, and it's quite, uh, it's quite easy, in fact, if you use just some very vanilla gradient descent or Newtonian method to get trapped in this local minima. Of course, there's more sophisticated ways that you can, uh, or algorithms that you can use along those lines. Uh, but uh, in fact, one has to be careful because this is not even necessarily a straightforward optimization problem because as I said at the beginning, it could be that if you were to include the full series uh, that comes from your OPE, uh, what is the global minimum in the truncated series might not even be the global minimum when you include everything. So it is more essential instead of just finding the fastest and best optimizer, let's say that you could you know, find the uh, something, uh, an, an algorithm that can determine the global minimum from the get-go, it might even not be the right thing to do. This invites the use of stochastic optimization methods. We would like to kind of scan and map out the landscape of this objective function. And as such, it's interesting to uh, try and uh, use uh, some optimization protocol, uh, which can be reformulated as a Markov decision process. And by that, I mean uh, some stochastic optimization, some random element in this optimizer, but at the same time, the agent has some uh, knowledge of the prior steps that it's, uh, that it's taken. So we, choose to, uh, we chose to employ reinforcement learning techniques in all of these examples, 2D and 6D, which I will not talk about explicitly, and 1D, which I will mention uh, later on. And I should say that this is maybe a slightly unconventional implementation of uh, reinforcement learning uh, as, as, a, uh, as an optimizer. But uh, uh, we had heard that RL algorithms are efficient in dealing with high dimensional search spaces, and uh, they are uh, very kind of efficient uh, Markov decision process algorithms. And we thought, you know, let's, let's, try, uh, let's try it uh, and see how far we can get. Having said that, uh, of course, you could try any optimizer uh, that you would like, uh, machine learning assisted or conventional. And in fact, in this latest paper, we did benchmark what we got from reinforcement learning against a standard non-convex optimizer. Uh, we tried many things, uh, but the best one, most of them, by the way, were hopeless. Uh, uh, but uh, there was one uh, the, which uh, uses interior point uh, methods called IPOPs uh, that uh, uh, worked very, very well. In fact, it worked even better than reinforcement learning in this case. But probably that was because this is a very simple problem. But uh, you're welcome to try your favorite optimization problem, Metropolis Monte Carlo, particle swarm, genetic algorithms like Ellie was uh, talking about uh, in the previous talk, and so on. Each problem might have an optimizer that works uh, better than, uh, than another. So it kind of depends on the case by case basis, at least uh, generically. Now, here comes the uh, point where I give you a few details about how reinforcement learning algorithm works in general. So uh, they have, an RL algorithm has an agent, and this agent interacts with an environment, which is a set of rules. Uh, the way that uh, the, uh, uh, um, the agent interacts with the environment is that it takes an action, interacts with the environment based on this action, and then uh, a corresponding state is produced. And then you construct some kind of reward function, which uh, might depend on the state and even on the action and the probability of taking this action. In the next time step, the agent picks different values for these parameters, makes a different action, and then they pr produce a different state and a different associated reward. And the goal of the RL algorithm is to maximize that reward, okay? Now, uh, the kind of interesting uh, neural network part comes in the fact that the algorithm with each iteration learns uh, which choices of uh, actions that it took 
will reduce long will produce long term the uh, the, the highest uh, the highest reward and eventually converges on an answer. And this is how these terms that I just gave for you uh, translate from reinforcement learning to this physical problem at hand. The environment that we have here is the set of uh, truncated reduced crossing equations. The action that the reinforcement learning agent makes is uh, a choice of a value for uh, the scaling dimensions n of p coefficient squared. The corresponding state that you produce is, uh, so here I have a discrete set of crossing equations uh, for, let's say, specific points on the cross-racial plane z and z bar. So there's a it's a vector with a, uh, the components of which is uh, uh, correspond to these uh, number of uh, crossing equations. And then once you plug in, uh, let's say, fixed values for delta and c, you will gain, you, you'll obtain some answer. And then the reward uh, should somehow measure the deviation of the, uh, um, that you have from satisfying the crossing equations. And a way of uh, uh, parameterizing this is uh, by one over the Euclidean norm of this vector. So, uh, you know, the smaller the deviation from satisfying each of these crossing equations, the higher the reward. If you were to satisfy all of them exactly, the reward would go to infinity. So this is quite a hard problem uh, because the, uh, both the action and the state space are continuous. Uh, delta and C uh, kind of uh, can take many real values. And if, however good your reinforcement learning algorithm, if you let it kind of, you know, try and search for the best solution, uh, it might take an infinite amount of time. So in order to try and explore the search space in a finite amount of time, we decided to kind of parallelize the, uh, the process uh, by deploying a large number of agents. And these agents, uh, in fact, are completely independent. They do not talk to each other, but it's kind of interesting to see how they explore uh, the landscape of this uh, objective function we're trying to minimize. We put this on the Queen Mary high-performance compute cluster in introduces another kind of degree of stochasticity because these searches have different starting points and they find different minima and so on. Uh, but uh, just to let you know, I mean, this is not, uh, we're not using any kind of sophisticated sort of super computer. Uh, the cores that we use are just standard CPU cores. And uh, in fact, uh, they're usually slower than the ones that you have on your laptops these days, but we could uh, deploy simultaneously, let's say 2000 of them in one go, which, you know, if we try to do it serially on a laptop, it would take like a very long time. So uh, the stochastic that I was mentioning is that uh, these large numbers of agents eventually return some result, and then uh, we uh, collect uh, a sample of them with the best uh, performance, the best reward. And what I will display later on when I show you some results is the mean of these best performing agents plus minus one standard deviation. So the error that we will have is a is a statistical error uh, in this uh, in this case. So these ones do not communicate with each other countries. They completely, but of course you could think of improvements uh, where they start communicating. So for example, there is a flavor of reinforcement learning, which is very in vogue called moral multi-agent reinforcement learning. So this would be something that, uh, you know, one could try to see if it improves performance. Yeah. Say again? Uh, you said that you yes, yes, I did. At some point, I even was running for 4,000, then I got blacklisted for a couple of weeks from the cluster. So one of my students produced a report. Uh, I couldn't run it anymore. He produced a report of the uh, highest uh, resource, uh, you know, intensive uh, jobs on the cluster for that month. And I think I was third from the kind of cancer center and something like this. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's what we did. Of course, then I asked them to run it. Uh, yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> very good. So there's many reinforcement learning uh, algorithms that you can that you can pick. Uh, the one that we chose is uh, this popular soft actor critic algorithm, uh, abbreviated as SAC. Uh, this is an algorithm that originated from the Berkeley uh, Computers Lab, uh, Robotics Lab, excuse me, and uh, it's uh, deployed in the context of a, a control task. Uh, uh, optimization uh, with robots, uh, but it's very widely used in a variety of setups, and these are the features that make it appropriate for our problem. First of all, not every RL algorithm can handle continuous action and state spaces. In this case, we have our deltas and c's are continuously varying, so we need this feature. Uh, it also uh, has a, a, a double uh, optimization objective as an RL algorithm, it seeks to increase the reward, but it also tries to uh, increase something that they call entropy, which is kind of a sort of randomness in how it achieves this maximum reward. So it tries to achieve the maximum reward by acting as randomly as possible, which would allow us to explore a larger 
uh, 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 part of the search uh, landscape. And finally, and uh, maybe more importantly, it's supposed to be a model-free and stable RL algorithm. So RL algorithms are notorious for working super well in specific problems, and then you try and port that to a different example, and it just completely fails. It doesn't converge. You have to like play with hyperparameters and tune extensively and so on. Uh, these people claim that uh, their model is uh, stable. And uh, in fact, it, it was the case. We just very, very minimally uh, altered the hyperparameters that appear in this algorithm, and it seemed to work uh, very well out of the box. So our Python implementation, I'm not as fancy as Ellie. I don't have a QR code for you to download. If you want to play with it, you have to go to our paper and find the link. Uh, but uh, we call it Bootstop for Bootstrap Stochastic Optimizer. It is available on GitHub. And uh, it uh, currently, as far as RL, RL goes, uh, deploys only the soft actor critic algorithm for minimizing these truncated reduced crossing equations. But we have uh, also now um, enhanced it uh, uh, and used a package called PIGMO, developed by the European Space Agency, uh, where you can uh, choose and cycle through a large number of uh, non-machine learning, non-convex optimizers. And in fact, we use that in this latest work. So as uh, uh, Masahito was, uh, was asking, uh, yes, you can swap soft actor critic for other newer, more, let's say, advanced uh, um, this field is moving very, very fast. 2018 is already ancient history. Uh, so with newer um, algorithms, which might be more efficient, like multiple multi-agent reinforcement learning, world models, and so on, you might be able to uh, get, uh, uh, let's say, better performance. And in fact, in the same way that there is this kind of wrapper, PIGMO, that allows you to cycle between non-convex, non-ML optimizers, uh, there is a something on stable baselines for RL algorithms that will allow you to kind of choose and, and benchmark against reinforcement learning algorithms as well. This is what the page looks like for our, uh, for our, for our code. I invite you, it's quite well documented. I give all the credit for that to my students. Uh, uh, there is instructions about installing, running the code and so on. And currently you can run it in uh, one, two and six dimensions. You need the conformal blocks, which we have pre-generated for it to run efficiently, but very soon we'll have also three and four dimensions uh, updated as well. Okay, uh, great. So that brings me to the uh, application part of the talk. And uh, um, this uh, application for you to see exactly how well this uh, uh, code performs uh, pertains to the 1D CFT that lives on a half BPS Wilson line in n equals four super young mills. So consider the infinitely straight Wilson line, which is given by this uh, path ordered exponential. It's a supersymmetric Wilson line. So there is one of the six scalars of n equals four appears uh, in this exponent. Let's call this guy phi parallel. The remaining five scalars uh, are given over here as phi perpendicular. So n equals four super young mills has a PSU2 2 slash four which for some reason doesn't appear in the PDF, uh, PSU22 slash uh, 4 superconformal group, uh, and OSP22 slash 4 subgroup of which survives on this uh, 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 for the theory on the defect. And this includes uh, the following bosonic subgroups, SO12, which is the conformal group in 1D, and SP2R, this is SO5, which is the R symmetry of the surviving uh, scalars, which do not participate in the construction of this Wilson line. And there's also an SO3 bosonic symmetry corresponding to rotations uh, within, uh, uh, let's say, two directions perpendicular to the, to the defect in, in n equals 4. What about correlation functions? If I want to parameterize correlation functions on the defect, I take expectation values of the Wilson line where I kind of cut the Wilson line open and insert localized uh, local operators at these points, as you see. Uh, from this uh, uh, expression over here. So I get my Wilson line from minus infinity to T1. You insert the local operator T1. You kind of patch it up and, and so on. And this is what I mean by these endpoint functions with these double brackets. So since I have a superconformal field theory, the spectrum is organized in terms of superconformal multiplets. These superconformal multiplets come in two broad, uh, two broad uh, categories. One is protected or BPS multiplets, and then there's also long multiplets. Protected or BPS multiplets have their scaling, the scaling dimensions of the superconformal primary, which sits at the bottom of that uh, uh, superconformal multiplet, determined in terms of the other uh, uh, quantum numbers of your, uh, uh, of, of, that, of that primary. The long ones uh, uh, can have dimensions which just have to satisfy the unitarity bound. Uh, 
Uh, there exists within this superconformal multiplex, this uh, special half PPS multiplex, BK, which contains the so-called so displacement multiplex. Uh, for example, B1 has these perpendicular scalars as their superconformal primaries, whereas phi parallel, for some reason, my PDF export does not like the parallel, these kind of vertical lines. Phi parallel belongs to the simplest long multiplet. So this is the lowest dimensional long mm -hmm. multiplet. So with this kind of introduction about the cast of characters in this 1D theory, uh, let's uh, look at the associated bootstrap problem. So I would like to think of this uh, four-point function of these phi one perpendicular um, operators on the Wilson line introduced at points one, two, three, and four. And there is an associated crossing equation that you can write down. This is a kind of compact way of encoding it. Note that in 1D, instead of having two uh, uh, independent real parameters uh, for your cross-ratio plane, you just have one, which is this chi. There's one uh, conformally invariant combination of these differences, x1, minus x2, 3, 4, and so on. These Gs are, uh, have an expansion in terms of 1D conformal blocks. 1D conformal blocks are just simple 2F1 uh, hyper geometric functions. And uh, moreover, you can uh, look at selection rules, which you can determine just by superconformal symmetry alone, which tell you that if you were to take the OPE of operators sitting in this B1, B1 superconformal multiplet, where these guys actually sit, what you would expect to get is the identity operator, the B2 multiplet, uh, uh, no other BPS multiplet, and in, uh, uh, an extensive uh, tower of, of long uh, multiplets as well. And it turns out that even though these B2 multiplets, which are BPS, have their uh, scaling dimensions fixed for any value of any kind of marginal parameter that you might want to vary, uh, in principle, their OP coefficients are unknowns. But at large n, which is going to be the regime that I'm interested in, you can use either integrability or specimetric localization to determine also these OP coefficients. So this piece here, H chi, which is a function of G, encodes this, uh, the part that I know from this uh, operator product expansion, and let's say of uh, phi one with phi one. Very good. So this is the, uh, and once again, I can um, apply the framework that I described over the last 40 minutes or so. Uh, you can produce a kind of re reduced and truncated version of this crossing equation, and then try to uh, optimize it uh, using reinforcement learning or another optimization protocol. Now, at large n, uh, as I said at the very, very beginning, there is uh, the integrability properties of n equals force per young mills kind of descend upon this 1D superconformal theory as well. And it turns out that you can use the quantum spectral curve to uh, even be able to track the anomalous dimension of your operators from zero to, uh, to strong coupling. So when I talk about coupling here, I mean uh, the uh, uh, Toft coupling of the n equals force per young mills theory. Um, you can package this in this in this way, which makes some of these graphs a little bit more compact. Uh, G equals zero is the same as zero Toft coupling. Uh, G equals four that I have down here corresponds to about Toft coupling two and a half thousand. So quite a big, quite a big range. So uh, what the group from uh, King's College did is they said, look, um, I could try and bootstrap this equation using the standard linear functional method, but I can do even more by using as additional input the scaling dimensions as functions of g of the first 10 long operators. So my unknowns are scaling dimensions and in principle OP coefficients for the long operators because of the way that uh, uh, this uh, equation here works. These are my unknowns. But now as additional input, fix even the dimensions of the first 10 long operators and then try to determine using the linear functional method the first three long OP coefficients. This combination of bootstrap and integrability, they dub bootstrapability. And uh, uh, in a series of very nice papers, they show you what they can obtain. So this is uh, a graph from the first uh, paper, uh, or maybe it's the second paper, but uh, they obtained uh, these results in the first paper. Uh, so uh, this, these are BOP coefficients for the first, second, and third long uh, multiplets appearing in this uh, crossing equation for the four-point function of phi 1, 1, 1, 1. And uh, you see here the allowed values for C1 squared as a function of G is a very, very thin line. So, I mean, essentially they've determined it. Uh, for C2 and C3 squared, there are kind of these big bands, but still this is better than these kind of, you know, big swathes of parameter space that you might otherwise uh, have if you did not use the uh, uh, information about the scaling dimensions of the first 10 long operators. It turns out that you can do even more. 
So in fact, uh, the four point function of interest that leads to the crossing equation that you apply the bootstrap to can satisfy two additional conditions. Uh, you can uh, recover them from uh, um, integrated uh, correlators. Uh, so they get two additional integral constraints on top of the information about the dimensions, the first 10 long operators, uh, and on top, of course, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the crossing equations. And uh, in a second paper, they uh, use that information again to even better determine the first three OP coefficients of that problem. And this is the graph that I showed you a second ago. Look at what happens to it when I use these integrated constraints. Uh, these bands basically uh, collapse to very, very thin lines as well. So um, here is where they declare victory and say that we have a very accurate determination of these OP coefficients using the, uh, uh, the linear functional uh, method. So what we wanted to do is to see how our approach could compare to, uh, to this. And uh, uh, we thought, let's try and ap apply our numerical algorithm and compare with these bootstrapability results for both cases, both the one without integral constraints and the one with integral constraints. And in fact, let's not just use reinforcement learning, but let's also try and use uh, some other non-ML optimization methods using this uh, uh, Python wrapper big mode developed by the European Space Agency, which allows you to search for over a large variety of non-convex optimizers. Uh, most of them were hopeless, uh, but uh, IPOPT worked very well. And maybe here I can make a technical comment. When you use these optimizers, you have to be a bit careful about how you set the, the windows uh, where you ask the optimizer to look for uh, values uh, for, your, for your data. Uh, because conventional and convex optimizers, you have to kind of fix this window uh, at the get-go and it will not look usually outside that band. So they're very sensitive to the window size. If the window size is too large, it will not find the minimum. If it's very small, you might not find the correct minimum. Uh, whereas our implementation uh, in terms of reinforcement learning with SAC uh, does a kind of relatively smart thing. So each time the reward improves, the window that you have recenters itself around the values that uh, have led to this reward. So then as the reward kind of keeps improving, uh, if you know, it is possible to scan a very large, uh, uh, very large part of your available search space, uh, which if you have, let's say, you know, 200 search uh, variables, can be uh, can be very difficult to implement otherwise. Okay, one uh, a couple of uh, final comments about uh, our implementation. So uh, we use adiabatics. We start from weak coupling, zero coupling, and flow in this uh, in, in the Toft coupling G, uh, and we uh, implemented uh, one more improvement compared to the work that we had in two and six dimensions. First of all, we um, no longer perform the hard truncation of these uh, sums. So this is my crossing equation. Let's say that I choose some point where I want to cut off the contributions from uh, uh, higher dimensional operators. Uh, in the previous approaches, you completely ignore this term and set it to zero. But now uh, we had the, you have a way, for example, at zero coupling, where you can compute this explicitly, and this piece is known of um, determining this tail at this particular value of the coupling, at zero coupling. Uh, and then the assumption that we made is that hopefully uh, this tail doesn't change as you change the, uh, you vary this marginal deformation parameter. And it turns out that this approximation is actually uh, a good one. And just keeping uh, this tail at the, uh, which you can determine for at zero coupling is quite uh, good and improves our results significantly. So um, even at zero coupling, I should say that the full solution is not, uh, it's not easy to determine exactly the OP coefficient squared uh, because there's operator degeneracies. Uh, the spin partition that we used, uh, I will show you exactly what it was in the next slide. Uh, it is, there's no spin in one dimension, so, so it's not really a spin partition per se, uh, but uh, there are some operators that you can uh, sort of organize depending on their degeneracy at zero coupling. So this is the engineering dimension. This is the degeneracy that you can expect, which is quite difficult to extract even using integrability. So you know at, op you know, at the... Uh, uh, engineering dimension one, you have one operator, two, and two, and so on. So uh, the way that we kind of went about is just, we introduced a whole collection of operators. We're just interested in the OP coefficients of the first three long operators. And the other ones we use as effective operators to somehow make sure that we get the best possible approximation of our, uh, our four-point function. Okay, so uh, I'm coming uh, up to the results. Uh, first, what kinds of runs did we do? Uh, for the reinforcement learning part, we used 200 agents. Uh, these are take quite a long time to converge, about 12 hours each. 
Uh, and uh, because they were so long, we only applied them. Remember, there's two problems, one without integral constraints and then one with integral constraints. Uh, we only use them in the case without the integral constraints. These IP opt runs, the non-ML uh, optimizer uh, is much, much faster. We run 4,000 batches of 100,000 agents per batch. So that's 10 to four times 10 to the eight uh, batches. Each of uh, these just takes 15 minutes to run in a, in a simple uh, CPU core. So uh, this is the algorithm that we used also for our uh, uh, the, the problem with the integrated constraints. Both of uh, these uh, approaches seem to perform better uh, than the linear functional method in the absence of constraints. And by that, you'll see in the next slide, they just sit inside the bounds that uh, the King's group obtained. And uh, uh, if you do include constraints, this IP opt uh, run uh, performs exceptionally well, especially when Delta two and Delta three uh, are uh, not nearly, uh, nearly degenerate. So there is some subtlety about uh, uh, when these things become almost uh, uh, degenerate, uh, our accuracy decreases. But okay, in the interest of time, let me skip some of these details and show you what these uh, the numbers look like. So here are, for example, at G is 1.2, what the results are from the uh, linear functional method with constraints. So as you can see, uh, these errors are, uh, because these are sort of exclusion bounds, uh, the value that you see here sits in the middle of the upper and lower bound. These uh, uh, um, bands here are teeny tiny, 10 to the minus eight for C1 squared, 10 to the minus four, 4C2 and C3 squared. And these are our results, IP out with constraints. You can see for the first one, we have uh, agreement of the sixth decimal place. For the second and the third one, it goes a little bit bound, but still there is agreement uh, at the second, uh, the second decimal place. And if you include this, this statistical error, so these are uh, not statistical errors, these are statistical errors. And these are the results for IP opt uh, and uh, soft factor critic when you have, uh, uh, we don't have the integral constraints. So a comment about precision. So in the standard numerical bootstrap, you need a lot of precision to uh, run your computation, sometimes uh, thousands of digits of precision. Conversely, in our method, uh, you only need machine precision, which for a 64-bit architecture is just 16 digits. So there's a massive discrepancy here in the precision that is needed. In fact, high precision is a, um, a problematic in trying to uh, further push the uh, standard linear functional uh, program. So we think that this is quite hopeful for the future. And yeah. Did you, um, yeah. Um, not necessarily. So this was this kind of trade-off with kind of if you increase the dimensionality. So in fact, here we did, even though we're on, only monitoring three data, we include a large number of operators. So in fact, uh, there is 62 operators, so it's 114 unknowns in this case. You know, the higher the dimensionality of your search space goes, the more difficult the algorithm finds it to kind of optimize in this high dimensional parameter space. So it's not completely clear that going higher is better, if you know what I mean. I think in incorporating that tail did more work than including more operators in the expansion, if that makes sense. But there's no, this is not an exact science, unfortunately. There is some experimentation that is involved, at least in these initial stages. Very good. So this is, uh, I'll, I'll finish with two, uh, two plots. Uh, this is the plot uh, for the bootstrap problem without the integral constraints. Uh, these are the bands that these, uh, uh, the King's group had. And these are the results that you can obtain with reinforcement learning or no reinforcement learning using IP opt. Uh, the squares and the dots uh, give you uh, the, the, the points that we um, uh, were the best results that we had. The statistical errors are actually so small that you cannot see them because they're smaller than the uh, symbols that I use to determine uh, where uh, the, uh, the mean lies. As you can see, both algorithms sit, give results which sit inside the bounds uh, that you get from the uh, uh, linear functional method. But it's interesting to see that they explore somehow different solutions. So different algorithms maybe uh, deal with uh, uh, a problem in a slightly different way when they have the kind of freedom uh, when they, it's not constraining enough, I should say. In this case where, you know, the band is very, very narrow, they almost kind of, you know, sit on top of it. But uh, the better, even better result is the one when you include the integral constraints. And in this case, uh, you see for the uh, C1 squared, we kind of land right on top of this. 
uh, for C2 and C3 squared, we're very, very close. There is this kind of slight issue when the operators are approximately degenerate in scaling dimension, the algorithm finds it very difficult to split which contribution to the OP coefficient goes to the second or the third operator. If you take their sum uh, or some linear combination, they're off, they actually do, uh, they, they perform very well. Very good. So in the interest of time, again, this is a technical, uh, maybe a technical note. So let me conclude. What I uh, introduced today is a novel numerical approach for the conformal bootstrap. Uh, the goal of this approach is to try and approximately solve these truncated reduced crossing equations for specific theories. You give me the theory of interest, uh, you tell me to solve my theory, I use as much information about it as I can, and then I try to find out uh, what uh, the bootstrap gives for the CFT data. Uh, our algorithm uh, gives a way of performing high dimensional searches. And I showed you that uh, even uh, though we've been doing this only for a couple of years, uh, uh, we are able now to get results which are comparable to those obtained uh, by, uh, by uh, the standard linear functional methods, in this case, by bootstrapability in 1D. It's useful to perform comparisons between our optimization, uh, uh, the, the implemented optimization uh, protocols, reinforcement learning using soft actor critic, IP opt, or your uh, favorite optimization protocol, stochastic gradient descent, Monte Carlo, genetic algorithm, particle swarm, you name it. And uh, uh, currently, Bootstop or Python uh, implementation is ready to use in one, two, and six dimensions. Three and four are coming up. Uh, uh, we have a Pigmo where you can use any convex, non convex optimizer that you would like, any integration with stable baselines, which switches or cycles between reinforcement learning uh, algorithms is also coming up. Uh, and uh, in the end, what is the kind of uh, ultimate goal is to try and combine maybe different optimization protocols uh, because different things might work in different scenarios uh, and, and then combine uh, also other information, for example, from the uh, linear functional method bounds that, uh, you know, here we're just trying to compare with uh, the bounds that linear functional methods give, but maybe you can use that as uh, as input and see how much better you can perform. There are some fancier versions of these uh, known as navigator functions, which tell you not only bounds, but you know in each search how far you are from a given bound, or you can do multiple correlators and so on. Uh, there is very uh, nice techniques from the analytic bootstrap that you can use here, like conformal dispersion relations, uh, OP inversion formulas, and so on to attack uh, your problem of interest. Let's say higher point bootstrap or more excitingly, maybe n equals four super young mills, n equals one super conformal QCD. And nothing that I said here relies on supersymmetry. You might even try and attack, let's say QCD in the conformal window. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. Yeah, great. So time for questions, comments. Yes. How fast How far? far? Yeah, how feasible? Oh, feasible. Um, well, I don't see any. Um, I don't see any sort of obstruction uh, to trying to. I mean, you have to set up like the problem. Uh, I don't. You know, you have to set up the crossing equation. You have to set up like you know the conformal presentation theory and so on. But uh, you know, if you were to give me, if someone were to do this and give me like a crossing equation, then you know I can try the tools that I have here. Um... Have you tried any non-unitary example? So I have not say, tried. Uh, I see. see. Yeah. Sometimes, for example, there are some say tensor network methods, etc., where. It applies to non unitary theory a priori, but sometimes there are in, in numerical instabilities. There are some extra subtleties for numerical subtleties yeah, in yeah, non unitary yeah. cases. I'm curious to see. Yeah, so we have, I mean, there's many, there's millions of things that you can try. Uh -huh. uh, so, for example, there was a recent paper by David Poland about the five point bootstrap and the use. I don't know if you're familiar with this Liotzi kind of hard truncation method uh -huh. of determinants. I, I believe our method is probably better to, uh, suited to, uh, to apply to that context. I see, so. um, you can do higher point, you can do, you know, yeah, you name it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've just given you a very small subset of examples and methods that we've used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I invite you to try. Uh, um... Great. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's uncross this segment.